So I met Dr. Nali long time ago. Yeah. In 2004, when I was invited to uh, Comicet in UK. So you can see that this picture 10 years ago. <laughs> so I was invited in group of Professor Amparayano. So at that time, Dr. Ali was uh, a uh, master course student in the UK. Yeah? So this is the uh, personal particulars. Actually, uh, it's not from uh, uh, Palestine, but from Indonesia. <laughs> now, his current position is a recent table. Now, his current position is the recent fellow at uh, two, uh, Korea, uh, Singapore. And uh, he obtained the PhD from uh, Fries Hebert Institute. Uh, Max Planck in Berlin. So this is the famous institute in the catalysis under the tuition of Professor Robert Sullivan. Yeah? He is a very famous uh, 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 catalyst guy. And Dr. Ali did his master in chemistry from University of Bangsa and Malaysia. And undergraduate from also from UK, University of Bangsa and Malaysia. Some of this publication in the established journals. I think you can browse them in the game. If you have what I do, I'd like to invite Dr. Abina to the table. Thank you very much. So, yeah, thank you very much for. Uh, I'd like to talk about the, the, uh, the role of carbon as a catalyst support. 
Uh, in this case, I'm using a proprioception of carbon nanotube growth. And the second part is carbon as an electrocatalyst for oxygen reduction uh, reaction that is used in non-active lithium oxygen battery. I will go into these details later. So a little bit into rest of the material. So it's probably one of the oldest materials that mankind has ever used. And uh, it's probably one of the earliest known materials that we have used uh, without realizing it's a known material. So probably you've studied this in your bachelor or even high school, that the carbon can have a tetrahedral and uh, triangle hybridization from sp 3 and sp 2 structures. And the combination of this has, is, can make like almost unlimited amount of fractional materials, starting from diamonds, so pure sp 3 to uh, graphite materials. Between in between, we have this other material that exists either in, in uh, nature or uh, in, in, you have to synthesize it in the lab. Right. Uh, in, a, in a graphene sheet, by just uh, bending it at a certain angle, you can also vary the, the structure of these carbon materials from fullerene to carbon nanotube to again back to graphite. So by, by uh, creating curvature or tension in the structure, you can create various uh, uh, electronic and physical and chemical properties uh, that has been exploited throughout uh, some time of research. So these are some uh, uh, microscopy images that I've collected to, to describe how vast this kind of material really is. In the first step we have this unorganized small case with three slide sp 2 amorphous carbon. We don't have any uh, we don't have any real orientation with respect to the projection of the microscope. And moving on to slightly more organized material, you have this onion-like carbon. It's actually graphene sheets that are rolled into an onion-like uh, uh, layer. And at higher scale, you have the carbon black. So carbon black is, is a well-known material that is used in, in batteries, in tires, and composites to improve electrical conductivity, uh, thermal properties. And I mean, in the modern age, probably some of it is present in our lungs too. And it's also a uh, product in combustion in, in engines. And moving on, a high, a more organized structure, you have carbon nanotube, a tubular roll, graphene sheets, and the traditional one is the perfect one is graphite. So this is just to illustrate how uh, a graphite structure is. So uh, carbon is, 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 is uh, well known in applications, especially in catalysis. And, other types of uh, application. The main properties of carbon is that it's, it's resistant to acid and basic media. If, if you anneal it at high temperature, it wouldn't get destroyed or collapsed. It's, uh, sorry. it's very stable. And you can modify the surface properties by just introducing functional groups or changing the, the uh, microstructure either from SP2 to SP3. And you can change the wetting properties, the, 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 uh, uh, the, the, the potential of the materials. And you can tune the pore size of this material by creating structures or templating it with other materials. And it is available in very few microscopic sizes from, from pellets to powders to grains to things. And traditional materials, carbon blanks, ethyl carbon graphite, these are quite cheap. These uh, very old materials, graphene, or uh, nanotube, uh, are still quite expensive. That, that's one of the reasons why it's uh, limited in its application. Uh, you can prepare carbon materials up to 3,000 per square per gram, which is a very big area, and it has a high internal conductivity. In fact, in, uh, in all batteries, you will find carbon inside because due to these properties. So these parameters are, are exploited to, to use as catalyst material, and this one is uh, for electrochemistry and storage. One thing to, to note, at least I will explain in my talk, is that this big interaction between Graphene layers that we normally use in our pencil, that's why it's so slightly <coughs> thin. This can help, this uh, is exploited in, in lithium ion battery to, to have lithium ion integrated in, in the, uh, between this layer. Right, so the motivation is that if you look into the, the uh, textbooks, uh, a, lot of, a lot of reactions are actually using carbon as support. So you can uh, read through here, uh, 
intonation was going to be significantly higher than that. You know, and someone reaches scale, and you have an amusement assist with the team all up and carving, and the fish and crops of the system are quite important in the desert industry. And of course, fuel cell. All, I think all, all fuel cell uses carbon uh, to support the uh, Why well, another motivation is the in our preliminary experiments that if we try to grow carbon nanotube out of two different structures, it's actually with the carbon, which is quite amorphous structure, and graphite, you get very different uh, results. Here you see at uh, 700 degrees where caffeine is, is decomposed from the colored carbon and hydrogen, you have a different density of material, uh, indicating that the growth rate is quite different. So if you notice that these uh, uh, are taken after two days of graphite and two hours of right? um, and the structure is quite different. Uh, they have a slight irregularity in graphite and graphite based arrangement if you grow them on uh, active carbon, whereas it's quite well oriented if you grow them on, on graphite. So in overall, in short, graphite is it's way better. Uh, carbon support for these reactions. So in the literature, we will address these differences due to porosity, surface function boosted by micro strains, such as on and carbon contamination. And I choose to focus on this part to, to, to actually the easiest one to investigate what is the role of the metal, what is happening on, on a metal when it's sitting on a carbon support. We, we can discuss about it later. Why these other types of variations are quite difficult actually to control the carbon material. Right. So going back to the uh, motivation again, the active carbon is a amorphous structure. Graphite is a very crystalline, uh, regular material. So when you face with this kind of problem, to to move forward is you have to simplify the problem and you want to design an experiment where, uh, where uh, the, the, the reaction mechanism or the reaction condition are simple enough for, to understand later when you see the results. And we use a model carbon support uh, with a suitable probe reaction. So the model system that we use is a vapor grown uh, carbon uh, nanofiber. This is from available commercially. So, uh, so uh, they have they, they have a range of vapor uh, carbon nanofibers synthesized in the same manner, but just a need a different temperature. So in terms of functional groups, they are both very minimal. So you can uh, neglect affect functional groups. And in terms of surface area and pore structure, they are the, uh, the same. Actually, the same material is need a different temperature. So you, you don't have the complicated problem for. They can interfere with the interpretation of results that come from surface area positive and so on. So in this case, the only variation mostly comes from the different surface structure that they all uh, have. The defective carbon has a very uh, defective uh, structure, as you can see here, like the long range order is quite short. And the graphic carbon is, as you see, is a very nice straight line of uh, roughly layers. So exposing on the base of eight. And uh, whereas here is mostly defects of personal effects. So we need a probe reaction. So as I already mentioned earlier, the probe reaction we are investigating is uh, carbon nanotube probe. So remember uh, what I said earlier that we want to investigate carbon contamination. So we want to have a reaction that is very sensitive to carbon contamination or carbon diffusion in the surface, on the surface, subsurface, or the bottom. So we choose carbon nanotube probe. So the, the process, I think if you are familiar with this, is quite very simple. You deposit a material onto a carbon support, you cast that in air, not high enough that it doesn't oxidize the carbon, because again, this is a catalyst, so it reacts with oxygen. Uh, and you reduce them, uh, this catalyst in hydrogen, in diluted hydrogen, at 300 degrees, and then increase the temperature and do the growth at 700. So in reduction, what this is the reaction you can get, the nickel oxide is reduced by hydrogen from the nickel water. Where in nanotube growth, uh, the empiric 
reaction formulas that can have carbon source, the catalyst will form solid carbon monoxide or whatever. And so the advantage is that the kinetic and structural changes of this reaction product can be observed in microscopy. You don't, instead of getting uh, numbers uh, from from chromatography or, or GC or whatever, you, you see the product. So it's easy to tell what, what, whether something is changing. And the, the, the nanotube mechanism itself follows carbon diffusion into the substance bar. So if if carbon contamination takes place, it will very likely disturb this very nice equilibrium. And another important thing is that the catalyst will eventually detach from the carbon surface. So this allows us to tell if the if once the catalyst is moved away from the carbon support, whether the influence is still there or not. So the uh, uh, results when you it was at the nickel nanoparticles on two, uh, two different uh, surfaces, defects rich and, and graphite uh, rich uh, surface. This, as you see, is quite significant. Uh, the nanofibers or nanotubes that grow from a defective carbon has a very an unorganized graphene structure. It doesn't have a specific orientation. This goes everywhere. If you notice here, the lines represent uh, the, the, the straight line represent the graphene right branch that is in, in in projection with the beam uh, the, the electron beam in the microscope in the TA uh, microscope. Whereas for the graphic carbon you see here the growth is very oriented. It has a one direction the position of the graphene are from the nanotubes. So we want to investigate what happened with the material before before it is uh, it starts growing out here. So if we put this material in high resolution EM microscopy and focus it to the interface, you start to see uh, imperfection, a lot of imperfection in the interface between the metal and the carbon materials and carbon surface. It's added some errors to explain so that if you follow the straight line here, once you reach the surface, the interface, it starts to have dislocation and spiration and so on. And similarly here. But if you focus on the graphite carbon, the sequence is quite contrast up to the edge of the interface between the graphite surface and the nickel metal particles, it still preserves this very nice crystal nickel uh, phase orientation. So it's very clear from this uh, data that the lattice imperfection stressing take place. Metal carbon in phase for the nickel defective carbon. Now, this is the first indication that something is going on in the uh, interface between uh, nickel and particles and the carbon. The second uh, measurement that we did was a bulk measurement, uh, x ray fraction. So, we just directly zoomed in to the uh, area where uh, the nickel reflection is the, the most, the most intense. This is for the defective support and the graphic support, as you see here. The gray lines was the black. The black one is after color science, the blue is after the use, and the red uh, curve here is uh, after growth. If you follow the straight line, you notice that uh, th this is the same sample taken after the material is heated or exposed to, or, uh, to gas. So it's an in situ XIV experiment. Uh, the measurements done at room temperature were all of the reactions that for these uh, conditions. So uh, after the growth, the, the, the nickel 111 uh, reflection shifts slightly to the left, indicating the lattice expansion. And it even split to, uh, to another uh, uh, 111 phase, uh, which is also similar to the reflection. So this is indicating that the material actually split uh, Basis. So there is um, material rich origin in carbon than the other. Whereas if you go to the graphite, the graphitic uh, surface, the, the scat, this reflection coming from the nickel uh, uh, and the particles, this 111 on 200, uh, fixed in the same position. 
meaning that the process, even if it will be pulsed or exposed to a lot of hydrocarbon, the, the reflection still stays the same. Meaning there has not been, there's not so many uh, expansion going on in the crystal atoms. So uh, the, the bulk spec measurement from the XRV point out that the, the carbon during the nanotube process dissolve more in the bulk and the positive, whereas for the graphitic material, it probably stays only on the surface, but not in the bulk. It's, it's not detected with XRV. So, so the uh, the next uh, investigation that we want to do is whether to to, to, to see if uh, on the surface of the nickel part whether there is also a change in the carbon uh, amount. So what we did here, we did an in situ XPS, uh, measuring XPS at under uh, slightly open pressure condition, in this case 0 0.5 millibar of either hydrogen and, and ethylene, that's the carbon source. So we start from the top, uh, 300 of the production unit, the, the uh, there is a pronounced difference between a material if it's if it's sitting, nickel or pulp if it's sitting on a defective carbon or a perfectly material. For a defective carbon, there is already a significant contribution from, from nickel carbide at 835.3 EV uh, and some amount of oxide. Uh, whereas in a graphitic material the nickel is easily reduced to produce only uh, can be nicely fitted with uh, one nickel metal one nickel to uh, be if you increase the temperature in the vacuum so what happens with the this is in a vacuum so no gas uh, around in the reactor so the nickel carbide signal jumps up so it's suggesting that there is more carbide going into the nickel particles on particles whereas in, in graph graphic materials the nickel stays relatively the same the metallic uh, feature it gets even worse when, when uh, ethylene is introduced into the structure, into the, into, sorry, into the system at 700 degrees. So the carbon dominates the nickel effective carbon, where there is still a significant amount of uh, metallic uh, uh, features on the surface of the, the nanoparticles. So if we open the reactor and bring it over to the TM, we start to see, we, start, we see the same trend. So the material behaves consistently at high pressure and at low pressure. So at low pressure with an effective carbon, the catalyst is basically it's not so active. You always see a small amount of deposition of irregular carbon materials, which is consistent with observed uh, with, with the uh, atmospheric pressure experiments. And the graphitic material is quite active. You build a lot of carbon nanotube uh, probably is shorter due to the kinetic uh, limitations at low pressure. So the structure is quite organized. So the, the orientations of the nanotube Going from a graphitic uh, support is quite uh, or well oriented with the crystal uh, with the crystal alignment, so the nanotube like uh, structure. So what have we learned now? So we know that some amount of carbon penetrates into the nickel nanoparticles either during heating or during uh, reduction. We know that from the XRP there's some amount of carbon dissolved in the bulk, mostly in the nickel effective material. And this dissolution creates strains in the interface, in the material, and the nickel crystal structure, and this may cause the activity to, to, uh, to change. The catalytic activity to change. So, just to come up with the model to simplify the understanding is that we put an nanoparticle, nickel nanoparticle, or actually nickel family pattern pairs, they should be the same. Or iron, uh, you start to see carbon going in from the effect surface to the catalyst and then through this behavior to material for reactions. But we need to test this, uh, this, this, this summary. So we wanted to deliberately, well, I mean, to test this then we have to, to, to somehow contaminate the graphitic uh, <coughs> material with dissolved carbon. How do we do this? So, in the reaction set that I explained earlier, we have this lubrication calcination reduction. So we wanted to introduce some more, small amount of carbon uh, onto the catalyst just before it grows. So, yeah, so after the reduction, we pulses 
the system with small amount of ethylene at 300 degrees to contaminate somehow the nickel and particles with some, some amount of dissolved carbon. Uh, this, this has actually been uh, the reaction of ethylene at low temperature uh, to, to create dissolved carbon is documented in, in earlier works. So what happened is that if we introduce carbon poisoning in between uh, between after this after the reduction, immediately the, the, the structure of the, the, nano, the graphite nanotube structure that is growing from the catalyst significantly changes. Here you see that the catalyst uh, with carbon poisoning is starting to have an irregular uh, plate-like structure and you can see up to the catalyst when it's going long tubes as one got a very perfect nanotube with, on a clean lithotic surface. So that proves our hypothesis that is consistent that uh, the carbon contamination on the catalyst surface or bulk changes totally the behavior of the catalyst. Right, so this brings to an important point. Uh, how we choose a cat how we choose a carbon material to, to use on the support and how to pre-treat the catalyst uh, not to have or to or to have some amount of uh, these features. So the second part that I want to talk about is uh, carbon as an electrocatalyst and oxygen reduction. So uh, carbon is, has been widely used in Energy storage and, and conversion uh, systems. It's used in electrical tubes, super caps, used in the high surface area, uh, using the batteries as an anode and, and uh, conducting material and used for, as fuel cells to support of the catalyst. So, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we're working with the, with the oxygen battery. The motivation is to study performance, theoretical capacity, and the density uh, of the system. Uh, it's almost to be about 10 times higher than it is now for lithium ion. So, if technology managed to pass this, this would be the alternative for electric vehicle. So, uh, this is a brief description of how lithium ion works. So, lithium ion uses graphite from well, the, the commercial establishment uses graphite anode, where the lithium intercalates between uh, the cathode and the anode. Uh, during discharge, the lithium moves from the, uh, uh, the anodes to cathode and, and the discharge to the vice versa. So the potential difference between uh, the redox couple of lithium going into the graphite and the lithium going into the, in this case, cobalt oxide is uh, inconceivable. Right, so the non acoustic oxygen battery is actually a fusion between lithium ion and, and fuel cell. So on the other side, it uses a lithium metal, uh, and then on the cathode side, it uses the carbon as a catalyst for support, and the oxygen as a catalyst. So this potential difference uh, resulted in an in, in equilibrium potential of 2.9. So, how does this work? So, during this shots, you have lithium as the anode and carbon as a template for oxygen to be infused. And during the course of the discharge, you start to get deposits, uh, oxygen, redu oxygen reduction product of lithium forming lithium peroxide. And finally, you need to get So, lithium being light and Reactive is one of the highest energy uh, density materials. Right. So a typical discharge curve, I and mean, when you apply a constant current from a battery, the battery is the following. So you have a supply of equal to constant voltage, meaning at this stage that the potential is constant when electrons being taken out right now from the system, reducing oxygen. And you have two of the potential, meaning a barrier that you have to overcome to make this work. One is the, uh, the potential coming from the electrolyte. If the electrolyte is conductive, then you have a very low IR drop. If the electrolyte is fully conducting, 
either because not so many, not, not so much of uh, ions around or this high viscosity, then you get this uh, ion that very high. And the second is the intrinsic material of the cathode. In this case, the total potential of the kinetics. So, uh, in, in the second part of the talk, I would like to, to highlight how we change the total potential of the kinetics. As a motivation, is that if you have a chemical material and you have something, an oxide, a product of oxygen reduction depositing on a, on a cathode, on a graph, carbon cathode surface, it will occupy a space. So the space that it occupies represents carbon surface area and porosity. But uh, there's also an important feature that carbon has that we have a basic plate and an S effect. So the surface energy of these two surfaces is quite different. Meaning that potentially the, the kinetics taking place in these two regions can be very different. So again, using the same approach, we need to have to test this, we need to have carbon with the same porosity surface area, it's not to change anything because you only want to change the, 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 the structure. So we again use the same material and different methods, electrochemical like methods to test this either transient methods <coughs> or uh, steady state uh, methods. The steady state discharge uh, uh, discharge material uh, with the scan, scan speed of going to a rate of charge. Right, so uh, this is a steady state experiment of it's called the industry of volatility. What it does is basically uh, you change the potential or the energy level of the cathode with the potential start, the instrument that you have, uh, to uh, increasing the uh, level of potential and see the current response of that variation. So if the material is very good, it immediately wants to increase the quality. You move to the left side of high energy, you start to see some current. If the material is very bad, then you don't have that current until you go to very what is, what's the consequence of this in a battery is that you lose the energy uh, of this material because the, the equilibrium, equilibrium potential is about 2.9. So when, if you keep going down to, all, to, to gain current, to overcome the barrier, either kinetics or, or uh, resistance drop, then you are working in this way which is not uh, desirable in, in a battery. You want to have as minimum uh, of a potential or resistance as possible. So we tested different, uh, I mean, same material functionalized in a different way. One is about potassium, yeah. and then another one is oxidizing it and an effective carbon dioxide. So in a, there is, a, there is a, an equation in, a, in, a, in basic electrochemistry that relates the potential, the whole potential, the shift of from the equilibrium potential and its response to current. It's called the Hubble equation. So what you do, uh, you do this potential steps where the immediate response would be the current generation, the reaction generation taking place at that initial time, in instantaneous time, in the transition method, where only the reaction between uh, oxygen and electrons is taking place without any other mass transport diffusion. So it's the first, uh, first response of the material. And if, if you plot the current versus the other potential, and uh, you get the intercept, that is the exchange current density, the I0, that is the, uh, the activity that the material has at those open circuit voltage. So this means that amount of material being, uh, amount of oxygen being reduced at equilibrium potential. So of course the higher the, this value, meaning that the more active the material is. So the trend is quite clear, but when you have the defect, or when you introduce defect to the roughly material, then you increase the activity of the oxygen production. Of course, one can say that if you oxidize the material, then you increase the surface area. Uh, I think people working in, in catalysis will know that if you increase the surface area, meaning that the, your, your activity will increase just because you have more active sites. So uh, to verify this, what we, what we did, is that we measured the double A capacitance. So the double A capacitance is actually the, uh, literally means uh, the, uh, the, the area, the electrochemical weather area is different with DET. DET measures in the condensed nitrogen 
uh, uh, isochron system. So in the in AA capacitor measurement, what you measure actually is the amount of electrolyte uh, charge or ions that is touching the electrode surface. So if you plot these two different materials, you end up with rather similar uh, uh, variation of the AA capacitor, suggesting that the area is the same. So what we're changing is the amount of uh, more to the amount of defects, or in this case, the active size. So, using this material in a, in a, in a, conf, in a typical battery configuration, uh, you see a discharge curve where it shows that when you introduce defect into this material, uh, your, the, the voltage of kinetic, the kinetic barrier that you have in this reaction increases, so that's why you have a high, high voltage including the reaction uh, in it. Of course, if, as this is the same uh, configuration, the I adult is similar. So the second summary is that defects in the material increases the rate of oxygen reduction for the lithium oxygen battery. And you can improve uh, the kinetics in the graphic material by introducing some amount of defects. Uh, right. So as the last word, I suggest you choose to cover wisely for your different types of experiments and of course to pre-treat the material accordingly not to uh, create an open side reaction for, um, for your experiment. With that, I'd like to thank you. Questions, please.
I mean, I want to have a, an image to justify that the, the, the growth coming, is coming from, from the nano. If it's going too long, then it can be. What is the effect of this carbon stock when you have the Uh, yeah. So, uh, in the first part of the presentation, I wanted to highlight that if you have an effective carbon and an active material, uh, the reaction between them is quite uh, uh, violent that the carbon is extracted from the defects and it goes into the bulk of the chemicals. And when this happens, uh, the orientation, the crystal orientation in the crystal and bulk, as we have seen with EM, Changes. Now, there are still reports in, in graphene synthesis or in other synthesis that you need to have a registry between the 002 plane of graphene and the crystal. And if you don't have a registry, if the crystal is just so messed up, then you don't manage to grow very nice uh, graphene layers. But that's one part. The second part is that there's been calculations. Uh, EFT calculation and Monte Carlo calculation suggesting that uh, a specific diffusion path is required to have a very nice CMT. So, if introducing carbon meaning that you disrupt the equilibrium diffusion in the catalyst, so the, the carbon will no longer follow one path to the level this. It will just go everywhere. That's what we see in the carbon uh, in the position. Uh, yeah. yeah, so there is no orientation. The garden is just growing randomly. It doesn't have a nice, smooth orientation. Oh, yeah, it doesn't have any carbon contamination.
Right, so the question is how to control, yeah, to control the defects in the, in the experiment. Uh, is, that, is this related to the first part or second part? Second part. So, uh, I have some make-up stuff. Right. So, I mean, you, you all know that some of the experiments you do in the lab is some of the, it's like black magic. So you have to do an optimization and, and, uh, to, to verify this. And um, uh, in this experiment, we create, we create the defects by oxidizing the carbon into mild nitric acid, or three, three mild. And uh, to monitor this amount of defect, we use Raman spectroscopy see uh, uh, semi-quantitatively the, the amount you can generate. So uh, with the graphite of carbon, you, you have these two uh, signature peaks. That refers to the graphitic bands, the performance vibration in, in the graphite, and the defects uh, uh, band. So if, if you introduce some amount of defects, then you have the defects that balance the increases. So this is called like the control. Does that answer your question? I mean, I I don't have numbers like how many defects that I produce. It's sort of like a relative quantity base. So, so the I need to I need to I D ratio to be about the basic uh, Yeah, I will. Yeah, uh, if, you, if you take the ratio and then put the factor, the properties you want to see. Oh, you mean to make uh, the different ratio? Oh, yeah, 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 Uh, what, what 
what is your um, average uh, average length of the CNF that you categorize as a defect CNF? Since the CNF can be grown longer than than the defect one, right? This is the second part. Uh, the, the, the first part. part. The you ask about the support, the support, or the product? Uh, the, the defect CNF. The, the support, the current support. No, 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 no. The, the CNF. Oh, the, the ones growing. Uh, the, the, the ones that's growing. Is it homogen? The size is homogen? The, uh, the, the length of the CNF is homogen or, that, or not? That's a good point. No, it, it's, it's not homogen. So that there is a variation mm -hmm. of the length. Uh, it could be to uh, different reasons. Uh, one of it being that the, the material has a has a distribution of particle size. Mm -hmm. But if, if it was at something on a support, uh, you, you will have a distribution. You will not have a uh, uh, one particle size. It will have a distribution from five to fifteen to twenty. Now. Uh, I believe that the, these, uh, the, the, the different particle size contribute to the length of the nanofiber CNF that is growing. But uh, regardless of the length, the structures, the, the, the trend is the same. That they have uh, uh, disoriented structure. Uh, sorry, uh, they have finger arrangement. So it's not uh, uh, a nanotube pipe or uh, stack perpendicularly to the axis or normal to the axis is just going running. surface. 
and it's not so reactive with, with uh, uh, so it's not an active hydrogenation reaction. So uh, it, it, there's a lot of dimension to, to, to your question. And the simplest answer would be that nickel a form of form carbide and it is a hydrogenation catalyst. So we know that it can act interact with 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 the uh, with the carbon. So if, if I do this with copper at a certain condition, I may be able to grow out it. But the condition is is difficult. It will not be easy to observe as it is. See if, if you I mean I uh, this is my approach to this. If you want to prove something, the experimental design would be that the a effect that you put in needs to be significant enough to be observed. If there, there might be similar behavior with zinc or copper, but the effect would not be so significant. And I would then need to put more effort to investigate it. And that's too much time. With nickel, it's just the best system. It's reactive enough. It grows under you. It's easy to observe. Sometimes you look into it, or sometimes you look into something in you. That was asking you to change the nickel to zinc. What what is what what would you get? What do you think? Well, I, I haven't I haven't checked the zinc. Yes, like for the group zinc, copper, also have oxidation number plus two and plus three. Same nickel. With uh, with with cobalt. It is also an active hydrogenation catalyst. It's, it behaves rather similar. Although the, 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 the trend may be similar, I've seen reports where a cobalt is also well known nanotube catalyst, by the way. So it, it can 